From Helvetica to Futura to Comic Sans, fonts, for a lot of people, is a love-hate relationship. But why do typefaces evoke such a strong response for so many people? Who cares about letters? The only good font is the Sopranos one, where the R is a pistol. And can a bad font actually be good for you? This is Reverend Rasmus Morling Hansen, and in 1870, his creation, the Hansen Writing Ball, went into production, giving users a single typeface without any choice of variation. These days, the choices of fonts available to designers is virtually endless. Just ask Dominique Fowler. My name is Dominique Fowler. Um, I'm known as the tactile typographer. Dominique is a typographer, speaker, and author whose doctoral research into tactile typography began in 2009. And as she explained, not all fonts are created equal. Well, the type of font you use, some of them work work well at what's called display sizes. So things like headings, billboards, posters, um, you know, large sizes. But then if you try and use them in a, a what's called body copy, so a block of, you know, fairly boring, boring normal text, um, not all typefaces can handle both situations. And so people tend to, you know, use a fancy twiddly font. So something like Zapfino, for example, is, um, you know, people love to make a coffee shop logo out of that typeface. But if you tried to write, you know, 200 words in Zapfino, all the little uppy downy bits would just crash into each other and you just, it wouldn't be legible. So we're getting more and more used to reading sans serif because most of the stuff we look at on the screen, all of your Facebook status updates, all of your chats, all of those sorts of things are usually sans serif which means it hasn't got the little twiddly feet and that's because the screen resolution it's too much detail so they just give you the plain boring text but yeah it tends to be that a serif for large amounts of body copy and a sans serif for the screen and then maybe a fancier display font for something that you want to grab someone's attention when it's larger for example Times New Roman may be an inappropriate choice for a five-year-old's birthday party but the perfect pick for your quarterly report Bush script might be an odd choice for your grandmother's obituary, but spot on for your film about a murderous stunt car driver. I often go on the radio to talk seriously about typefaces and all they want to talk about is Comic Sans because <laughs> it seems to be this public debate about, you know, what using Comic Sans says about you. Um, the way I describe it is the typeface that you choose is like the outfit that you choose and there are appropriate outfits for appropriate situations. If I showed up to a business meeting in my bikini, that's fairly inappropriate. If a businessman jumped into the ocean in his suit, you would think that was fairly inappropriate. If you went in a clown outfit to your wedding, that is inappropriate. But if you're at a children's party and you're the clown, you probably shouldn't be wearing a wedding dress. So all of these you know, outfits are appropriate for different situations and the typeface choice is exactly the same thing. The perfect example of this occurred in 2012 when CERN, the Swiss home of the Large Hadron Collider, announced that it had discovered evidence of a Higgs boson particle. This was a hugely influential discovery in the world of particle physics, but for some reason which I still don't understand to this day, they used Comic Sans to tell the world about one of the greatest scientific discoveries of the 21st century. This is perhaps one of the best examples of how the choice of typeface can devalue content. However, fonts that are hard to read actually have some advantages, believe it or not. This is Professor Shane Frederick from Yale University, and in 2005 he devised a quiz that was administered to about 3,500 Harvard students. It's known as the Reflective Cognition Test, and it shows off our brain's two cognition systems. Our quick and impulsive system, which runs almost all the time, and our slower, more analytical system, which we use in deep focus. So here's the question. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? If you said 10 cents, you'd be in the same boat as 55% of Harvard students, but you'd be wrong. Of course, the answer is five cents. There were three of these questions on the test and the worst you performed meant that you were more prone to what Frederick called cognitive bias. Meaning you were more likely to engage in quick and impulsive system of thinking rather than a slower, more analytical one when approaching a problem. 
but there was a very simple way to improve your results on this test. He found that if he was able to change the font of the question to one that's harder to read, the percentage of people who got all three questions right went from 10 to 65%. But why is this? Well, there are a couple of things that will alert the brain to switch it from this automatic, quick, effortless thinking over to a more analytical, slow and focused thinking. One of these things is cognitive strain. This cognitive strain occurs when information is more difficult to process. Like, for example, when written in a difficult to read font. So, whether it's a good font, or an awful font, an understanding of how fonts convey information and how they affect us is essential if you want to get your point across. Hi guys, thanks so much for watching my video. I have an absolute love affair with fonts and typography. I've just always found them really, really pretty. So this video was really fun to do and it was such a thrill to be able to talk to Dominique about typefaces and fonts and stuff like that. I'll be putting up the full interview with her soon. But in the meantime, subscribe for new videos and more content in the weeks to come. Uh, so thanks so much for watching and I'll see you very, very soon.